In this video, we're going to review forces and Newton's laws. The first thing we learned about forces and trying to explain why objects move the way that they do is that objects naturally resist changes in their motion. Resisting changes in motion is a proper word to call inertia. A fancy word for change in motion would be acceleration. So if something is still, it's naturally going to stay still. If something is moving, it's naturally going to keep moving in a straight line with constant velocity. The in a straight line with constant velocity part is really critical to understand. Um, again, we call this property inertia. All objects have inertia. And the way that we measure the inertia is with the mass. Remember that we use the kilogram as our unit of mass in physics. So if the forces on an object are balanced, meaning that the net force is zero, then the object is either going to stay at rest or it's going to keep moving in the direction it was already moving with a constant velocity in a straight line. So the first law of motion is often referred to as the law of inertia. This condition where the net force is zero and the forces are balanced is often referred to as static equilibrium. So, the way that we know when something has or is in static equilibrium are words like the forces are balanced, the object is at rest, or it's moving at a constant velocity. When you see those words, you should highlight or underline them or something um, and make a note that means that the net force is zero. First thing that you're always going to do when you have a force problem is draw a free body diagram. Make sure that you draw the arrows to scale and that you go in the correct direction. Then write a net force equation for each direction of motion, vertical and horizontal. So for instance, you might have a net force in the y direction that looks something like that. Typically, we make up be positive y and right be positive x when we're balanced. Third thing we're going to do is if we have any forces that are at an angle, we'll resolve those into components. Don't go back and draw components on a free body diagram if you're asked to draw it specifically as part of your test question. Um, go and make a separate vector diagram off to the side somewhere. And then apply any other equations that you might need, such as force of friction equations, force of gravity equals mg or Hooke's law or something like that. Then solve for your unknown. So let's talk about Hooke's law just a little bit. Um, we did a lab where we used the stretch of a spring in order to measure mass, measure forces in general using stretch springs. The greater the spring stretches, then the greater the force exerted on it must be. And we can easily measure the stretch of a spring with a meter stick or other ruler, and therefore we have a convenient way to measure forces. If we plotted the force as a function of the stretch of the spring, the steeper the line is, the stiffer the spring is going to be. Um, the slope of that line, we give the name k, k stands for the spring constant. It's basically a number that tells us how stiff the spring is. The unit for the spring constant would be newtons per meter, and Hooke's law can be expressed as an equation where the force in the spring is equal to k times x. The negative sign is just put in there to indicate that the stretch of the spring is always in the opposite direction as the force the spring exerts. Pull a spring to the right, it's going to exert a force. If a surface is inclined, we are going to set our x-axis to be parallel to the surface and our y-axis to be perpendicular to the surface. That way most of the forces that we're dealing with are either parallel or perpendicular to that surface. The only one that's not would be the force of gravity. So we're going to have to resolve the force of gravity into, into components that are parallel and perpendicular to the incline. The y component will look something like that, and then the x component will look like that. You might tilt the paper to the right so that the blue arrow is parallel to you um, to make it easier to read. 
the angle theta that your incline makes with the horizontal will correspond to the top angle on that triangle between the hypotenuse and the red y side. And so in general, the FGY component will be FG cosine theta, and the X component will use the sine to find. So as an example, let's look at number 6, part C in your review. Where our setup looks something like this. We have an object on a 53 degree incline, and a string holds it up with, four, with 20 newtons of force. Um, there is friction on this thing, but before we can figure out the direction, we have to figure out if that tension force is larger than the gravitational force pulling it down the incline. So we know it's going to be parallel to the surface, but we don't know which way yet. So if we resolve the weight into its two components, we would get the y component to be 24.1, which might be important, it's something else and the x component to be 31.9. You can round those to 24 and 32 if you want. Um, so the frictional force has to be up the incline because the 20 newtons of force that the tension is providing is not enough to hold it in place. 31.9 is bigger than 20. And so now we know that the friction force must be up the incline. We can write our net force equation to look like that. Tension plus friction minus gravity in the x direction. The forces are balanced, it's at rest, so the net would be zero. And then I can go and solve for the frictional force. And when we do that, we get something like 12 or 11.9, depending on how you want to round that. When the forces on an object are unbalanced, meaning the net force is not equal to zero, then the object is going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. If the net force is in the same direction as it's moving, it'll speed up. If it's in the opposite direction that it's moving, it'll slow down. The acceleration of the object is proportional to the net force. It's inversely proportional to the mass of the object. This idea is typically referred to as Newton's second law. And so we have the equation A equals net force over mass, which we can rewrite to be net force is equal to mass times acceleration. When we have an accelerating object, make the direction of acceleration positive whenever you're writing your net force equations. This will just save you the trouble of having to go back and make your acceleration negative if you don't do that. Newton's third law is about the pairs of forces. Um, an object is needed to cause a force. You can't have a force without an object that causes it. And the force that's caused, that's caused by that object is going to be part of a pair. We call those action and reaction force pairs thing to remember here is that they're equal in size, but opposite in direction. Um, a typical misconception is that those would be balancing forces. They don't balance each other because they are acting on different objects. So when you push an object, it pushes you back. Those two forces are on different things, and they're not balancing each other. So let's look at another example. This is number nine in your review. You have two objects, one that's on a surface, like a table, um, and it's attached to a second object by a string that's passed over a pulley. The masses of these two things are known. We know the frictional force on object one, and our job is to figure out the acceleration and the tension in the string. So the first thing you would do would, draw, would be to draw a free body diagram. There's the free body diagram for object one. There's the free body diagram for object two. The tension in the string has to be the same throughout, so those t's will be the same size. And because they're connected, they have the same acceleration. So the net force on object one will be t minus the force of friction. Net force on object two will be gravity minus tension. Notice that for number one, we picked right to be positive. For number two, we picked down to be positive. 
and that way we don't have to worry too much about the signs. So I'm going to write the two equations like this. Because we're accelerating, Newton's second law applies, so net force is going to be mass times acceleration. So since the mass of object 1 is 3, I'm going to write 3a instead of net force. And for number 2, I'm going to write 7a instead of net force. The frictional force I know is 20. The gravitational force in object number 2 is 70. And so I've got two unknowns, and I can eliminate one of them by adding those two equations. So if I add them together, the tensions are eliminated, and I get 10a equals 50. And so A would be 5 meters per second squared. All I have to do to get my tension force is just go back and plug in my acceleration into either of those two equations. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Just make sure that you plug in correctly and then solve for the tension. Last thing to discuss is the idea of friction. Remember that friction opposes the relative motion between two surfaces. It doesn't always slow things down. Friction depends on two things. Number one, how rough the surfaces are. We quantify that with a coefficient. Call that the coefficient of friction. Give it the symbol Greek letter mu. And that's something that has to be measured. You can't just calculate that from um, simple information. The second thing that friction depends on is the normal force, basically how hard the two surfaces are being pushed together. If the two surfaces are moving relative to each other, then the force of friction is going to be kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is always equal to some coefficient, call it mu k, times the normal force. If the surfaces are not moving, we're going to call that static friction. That means the surfaces are at rest. The thing about static friction is that it varies depending on the other forces. Could be zero, or could be some other value all the way up to some maximum value given by mu times the normal force. This mu would be different. We'd call it mu s, coefficient of static friction. Um, and we can kind of summarize that with an inequality like that. So remember, if you're finding the force of static friction, chances are you're not going to use the coefficient times the normal force. Chances are what you're going to do is use your free body diagram um, and write a net force equation to figure out how big the frictional force is if it's static friction. Hopefully this review video has been helpful for you. If you have any questions or um, comments, please let me know during regular class time.